Okay, hello everyone. My name is Tom Wilson. Uh, you're watching the ADAPT Productions show. Um, this is the uh, disability program we've been running for quite a few years. And today we're honored to have our guest, Laura Van Pembroek. She's an occupational therapist from a Rush University. And we're gonna be talking about emergency services for people with disabilities. Um, Laura, do you wanna talk about how some of this began? Sure. Hi, everyone. And, and I just want to say thank you to ADAPT um, Productions and to um, everybody involved for asking us to come here and talk about this issue because it's a really important issue. And I think most people in the community really don't have a good understanding of it and should have an understanding of it. Yeah, so I, I think we know people have suffered because it's yes. not well understood. Right, right. So um, I'm actually co-leader with... Um, two other individuals, Kira Meskin and Kristen Bush, of the PPE for People with Disabilities Coalition. And this coalition basically began um, in March of 2020 when COVID shut everything down. Right. And um, I know Kira has been on this um, before, and she went over a lot about the formation of the coalition. But it's a coalition that is, um, we have us as the co-leaders, but we also have a huge amount of individuals that participate and um, we work, we meet um, twice a month and um, it is a coalition run and for people with disabilities that focuses on um, really initially PPE and access to PPE in response to COVID. Um, and for people that live in the community and receive home and community-based services, and as well as their personal assistance, their, their support staff. So when COVID happened, we recognized that people living in the community that were receiving these services and their PAs were not having getting access to PPE right. um, at all. And they reached out to... Um, Progress Center, which is where Kira worked, asking for PPE or where can we get it. Um, and we really recognized that there was a serious um, disparity in communications and access to PPE that HB HCBS, Home and Community-Based Service Users, um, were, were, were receiving compared yeah. to other people. I, I know there were uh, personal assistants that come into the home who were not vaccinated, for example. Right. And if you're relying on those services to get you out of bed and they feed you and all of that, right. um, you want to be protected from the virus. And we know that that was not happening the way it should. Not at all. And, you know, those personal assistants or PAs, those personal assistants also see multiple, potentially multiple people in a single day. So they were going to one person's home, providing the services that the person needs, and then potentially seeing um, going to another person's home, and nobody had PPE. And personal assistants are considered essential workers, um, and they needed to be um, supplied with, P uh, with PPE, um, and that just wasn't happening. Yeah, and that was the failure of the state, who right. it, it ultimately pays them, and, and uh, yes. it's yeah. their responsibility. Right, right. So, we created this coalition and then initially we basically just did a grassroots of developing PPE kits out of Kira's garage and, um, and delivering them to individuals that um, we had 
identified as needing PPE. Um, people that had reached out to us, we did a survey to um, identify how many people needed how many supplies. Um, and we recognized that pretty much people needed like thousands of, of face masks, thousands of gloves. Um, and um, to be able to stay healthy, to not end up going to the hospital, not get COVID, um, and, you know, a fear for their life, really. Sure. So it was a terrible, it was really a terrible experience. Now, so our coalition did that. Yeah. yeah. We do know that people who were living at home were safer than the people in the nursing homes. Absolutely. So. But the, at least the people in the nursing homes initially started receiving um, PPE. Um, the, the, not all. And definitely there were some nursing homes that received more PPE. But we know that um, folks that were in nursing homes or institutions had more access to PPE than people um, that w live in the community. Right. Yeah. But unfortunately, the COVID found its way into the institutions. Absolutely terrible, yeah. Um, could you give me a background on, on some of the history of how emergencies have developed for people with disabilities? I know in the case of Katrina in um, New Orleans that some people were left uh, in nursing homes and drowned to death right. during the storm. Right. Are there other examples of tragedies where people with disabilities didn't get services or rescued like they, oh, they should have been? Absolutely. I mean, Katrina is a really um, a, a terrible example of, of how a, a natural disaster or a disaster or an emergency differently affects or more significantly affects a person with disabilities. And I think a really great example is thinking, and, and there's lots of examples of it in, with Katrina, is thinking about uh, just a power outage and um, that if, if I am experiencing power outage, I worry about my food in my refrigerator, right? right? But if you are a person that uses a ventilator to be able to breathe or to help you in your breathing, um, if you have an electrical, ad, electrical outage, um, that's life-threatening, life-threatening. Mm -hmm. And in Katrina, there, was, it, it, there were a long period of time when people all across the city did not, oh, in the area had no electricity. And um, I mean, you see that same example repeated over and over down in Texas last year during the snow storms. The um, same kind of power outages were affecting people there. Mm -hmm. um, after 9-11, we had a lot of different types of disaster um, and poor emergency response with being able to evacuate people because um, you know, elevators weren't working, but they, you know, buildings that were supposed to have the um, equipment to be able to easily evacuate someone didn't have those. And most, most high rises are required to have um, equipment to be able to evacuate people, and most of them don't. Yeah, I don't see that very often. No, no. Um, I know that Illinois has had some flooding issues on the Mississippi where people were affected. Yep. And I also know that, you know, when you're taking somebody off of a rooftop, Somebody who has uh, uses a wheelchair has mobility impairments isn't likely to make it to the rooftop. No, no, no. So yeah. So. Yeah, and so we know that this has been a huge problem. So how did this come to the attention of of the group? I mean, how how did it, you evolve this? Yeah, I yeah. Guess? So. When we started to reach out to the Department of Human Services um, and then specifically the agency that supports the PAs and the consumers that use home and community-based services, which is the division of um, rehab services, to to say, hey, we've got this issue, we'd love to help you. Um, and um, we met with DOORS, or the Division of Rehab Services, a couple times and provided them, provided them with the statistics that we had um, identified as far as how many masks, how much PPE was needed, provided them with stories of individuals. Some of the individuals are stories from people that were in our coalition. And, mm -hmm. um, and the... Um, the individuals that were um, in charge of doors basically felt that, you know, thank you very much for that information, but we think we're doing a good job. Um, and um, <laughs> and they, um, they really felt that they had, their response was adequate, um, and we were telling them that their response was not adequate. And, um, and so what happened from that point was us exploring 
other states' situations, mm -hmm. looking at our emergency response plan from, like, why wasn't DOORS working? Why, was, why did the, we see such a disconnect? Why did they feel like they were doing a good job, but what we were seeing at the, at the, you know, on the ground level right. wasn't happening? Where's the disconnect? And so we, despite what in the state of Illinois, the Illinois Emergency Operations Plan, there's, there's great literature that describes the policies that are supposed to happen, but implementing those policies was failing. Yeah, and do they mention disability? They, they do mention disability um, briefly and generally and broadly, but not, mm. not in a way that provides specific guidelines on how we will address the needs of different users, right? right? Communication Access, issues, right? Communication right? Communication issues, mobility issues, sensory issues. Evacuation right? needs. Yes, yes. All so, of that, right? I Equipment mean, uh, needs. And one of the things, a really great example of poor poor planning in the state of Illinois, is um, when when the city first responded and turned McCormick Place into a place for folks to go. Right, mm -hmm. it was completely inaccessible. Mm -hmm. They really had not planned for anybody that had mobility issues. Um, that I know for a fact. I don't know if they'd planned for anybody with sensory like blind blindness or um, people from the deaf community or yeah. any of those other communities. Well, another group that was formed here in the, uh, Chicago was the Institutional. Institutional Rescue and Recovery Committee, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they were recommending that uh, people in nursing homes be evacuated to hotels because the hotel rooms were totally empty. Right. And in the nursing home, you had sometimes three and four people in a room, and you know, so the bed so close you could touch each other, right. and that meant that the thing just swept through there like wildfire. Right. And you know, if people had been moved out yeah. and and the services provided in the hotel. I, we think many lives could have been saved. Absolutely, and there are states that had really had implemented really wonderful plans and did that. Um, Col Colorado had a wonderful um, response, and um, and we urged um, IEMA to to reach out to Colorado and maybe have a conversation and see yeah. how they're doing it. And we're not quite sure if they did that or not. But okay, now that um, I know that from your work you decided that you needed a, a political solution in a way, right? Right, right. So you got the legislature involved, I believe. Yeah, we did. So, you know, um, I mean, one of the things that we, we had a significant advantage of is because in our coalition, we had individuals that um, had a strong history of advocacy, you being one of them, um, but also Larry Biondi, um, Clark Craig, and... Um, um, and Gunther, and um, I'm missing one person that I was going to mention. Oh, Michael Grace. Yeah, Michael. <laughs> and, um, and all of the individuals that have had a history and knowledge on how to reach out to legislators um, and had direct relationships with the legislators was like, okay, we need to do something here. So um, they connected with um, Senator Julie Morrison. She was the, we connected with a variety of senators. Um, Senator Morrison was the one that was most engaged, had mm -hmm. I think a really strong relationship with Larry and, um, and she listened. Mm -hmm. um, and she was very, you know, very passionate about this issue and um, agreed to help us write the bill. Yeah. Um, we drafted it and she fixed it. Right. <laughs> and, um, and then she was the primary sponsor along with, along with um, Senator Laura Fine. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they submitted it to the state Senate. And um, from the Senate, it was went through a lot of processes that we learned about, yeah. but um, and then it went to um, the House of Representatives. John Carroll was our primary sponsor in the House of Representatives, and the bill passed um, unanimously. A bipartisan bill in the state of mm -hmm. Illinois that passed unanimously, um, and it's considered. It's called Senate Bill 921. Yeah, and from what I know, very seldom do. Um this legislation coming from the public pass in its first year. So that's quite an accomplishment. Thank you, thanks. We worked really hard. Um, we learned a lot in, in, um, in a very short time. Um, we constantly you know, reached out to community members, agencies, um, and um, had people do constantly do witness slips for us, which I think I never knew what a witness slip was before this. Um, also, we... Um, 
We, when our bill went to a couple different committees where we, we did some research and we were concerned that it would die in committee, we reached out to Senator Morrison and we were like, please get it out of this committee, and she was responsive. So mm -hmm. um, I think because of that work and because of our networking, um, it, it's one of the reasons why it survived. Yeah, clearly you had a good sponsor and that yes. made a lot of difference, Big, I think. Yeah, yeah. Now, what, what did the legislation say, or what did it do, or how, how, how did that work? Yeah, so Senate Bill 921 amends the Illinois Emergency Management Agency's um, emergency response plan. Mm -hmm. And what it says, basically, is that, um, and this is a very crude um, um, description of it, is basically says that we're going to review all of the different um, agency plans um, and protocols that exist, and we are going to ensure that disability and all disability community members are considered in not only the, um, the protocols, but also the implementation of the emergency responses. So at a state level, at a city level, county level, um, look across the board. Mm -hmm. So it really is going to be a, a long process. I mean, it, we have a five-year plan, um, and hopefully at the end of it, the um, state's plans for emergency response will be efficient, effective, and equitable for people across our society. Okay. Now, I know that one of the things it created was a, an advisory committee for IEMA, right. which uh, specifies that there be a certain number of people with disabilities. Can you tell us more, yep, more yep. about that? So the um, Access and Functional Needs Committee is um, are, are the folks that will be doing these reviews of the protocols plans. And the Access and Functional Needs Committee um, is a direct response of nine, uh, Senate Bill 921. The committee is comprised of nine members of the disability community, um, as well as representatives from IEMA and other emergency response agencies across the state. So um, I can't remember exactly how many people are on the committee. I'd say roughly 15 to 20. It's a large committee, but right. um, nine, nine individuals are folks from the disability community. Yeah, I know that the Department of Aging and mm -hmm. the Department of Human Services are included right. in that. I'm looking up some names. And um, <laughs> I think there's uh, also members from uh, local responders, correct? Yes, yes. And in fact... Um, we, um, in our first meeting, we, um, I'm flipping through my notes because I want to find the list of people that are um, in, on the committee, but um, the, um, um, the person that is the chairperson of the um, committee, his name's Todd Roach. Okay. He has a history of emergency response, but he's uh, also um, an individual from the disability community, identifies as having a disability, and um, he's also mayor of a small town in rural um, southern Illinois. Oh, how nice. Yeah. That's a good background. It is, it is, it is. And who else is on this? Yeah, page? let me, I've got them written down here. I think I must have it on the very last page on the committee, so Todd Roach is the, the chairperson, and then um, Kira Meskin, so the, one of the co-leaders of PPE for People with Disabilities is the vice chair. Um, Judith Leviton is our secretary, um, and then other individuals um, that are from the disability community are Randy Colon, Dorothy Cox Stowe, Jay Jen Pack, Coach Kenneth Jennings, um, uh, Sam Knight, and Angela Botts, um, and then we have, as we said, um, uh, representatives from the ver various different emergency agencies. And, and I know there was some effort made to have a diversity of types of disabilities, diversity in terms of uh, race and gender. Yeah, and, yeah. And I think that that's important because different communities get impacted in different ways. Absolutely. And the perspective of what your experiences are is going to be so powerful in us making a really well thought out emergency plan. Um, and I'm hoping that it's one that other states mm -hmm. um, can look to um, as a best practice. Now, I think the uh, governor was responsible for appointing people, am I correct? Mm -hmm. But I think you made recommendations to him. Yes. How, how did that process go? So um, um, the coalition, the PPE coalition, sent out massive amount of emails um, to individuals that had really helped us in the process of distributing PPE, mm -hmm. as well as um, getting the bill passed. So mm -hmm. we made a lot of 
um, great connections um, in, in that process and people that were com clearly dedicated um, and committed and concerned about this emergency response issue were individuals that we recommended or encouraged to apply. Um, mm -hmm. The pa application process wasn't the simplest thing. You had to f um, write a like a personal statement, um, supply your CV or your resume and right. to show they, you they know, history. Check your background, I believe, And I right? think they checked your background, right? right. Yeah. Um, and on the committee, there's individuals that are appointed. So the committee's all the individuals that were appointed by the governor, and those are the voting members of the committee. But there are non-voting members of the committee, um, and I'm one of those, and I, are you a non-voting member? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I know um, a variety of, like Robin Jones is a non-voting member. Um, uh, Karen Tamley is a non-voting member. Those, the non-voting members were um, voted in and approved by the voting members. Um, and we will have, we have a fairly loud voice, as loud as our voice wants to be. We cannot vote, but um, we're there to assist. Okay. And I understand that the group has met a couple of times now, the uh, advisory committee, right. the uh, functional needs and access group. Yep, is yep. That one. And uh, how, how have those meetings gone? They're okay. I'm learning a lot about legislation yeah. and how our, our process like, is a democratic um, process that's intended to be fair but slow. The first meeting basically was one of um, introductions and, and the voting of the, um, um, having the voting members all um, meet each other, voting on the non voting members. And the, the second, officers, choosing the off officers. Right? The second meeting was the choosing of the officers. Oh, okay. Um, and we just had a meeting yesterday or the day before, I can't remember. Yesterday. Yesterday, thank you. Um, and it was really to start to approve. Um, issues that will define our mission and vision and, and the strategies that we use. But first, um, uh, approving like just definitions, like d approving what is the definition of disability? What is the definition of access and functional needs? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, where do we draw from to um, use, find those definitions? Yeah, I know from past experience that like Social Security and Medicare and all these different agencies have their own definitions of disability. So mm -hmm. there's a lot to uh, mm -hmm. choose from. Mm -hmm. yeah. The states probably have different ones and oh, so on. Oh, definitely. And and like, for example, yesterday when we were um, having the conversation about um, an, an older adult or uh, elderly, what the definition is of the person that's, um, and I'm blanking on his name, but the person that's our representative from the Department of Aging said, oh, their definition, which is what we were gonna use, their definition is in the process of being changed. So, <laughs> so it'll, it's a, it's a, it's a, it will be a living document. Right, Yeah. moving forward. Right. Uh, um, are there, does the group have uh, some, what would I say? an outline or an agenda that they're trying to uh, promote in this process? I mean, I know it, the community is well represented, but sometimes you need a plan to move right, forward, right? right. So I think um, <clears throat> initially w the short-term goal, the short-term goal um, for the Access and Functional Needs Committee is to um, outline within the next year um, what we will do in the whole five years. Mm -hmm. So we, identifying what the long-term goals will be, um, agreeing on what those long-term goals will be, and achievable goals. We, we don't want to set us up um, to you know, work and not, not achieve the goals that we want. So this first year, the short-term goal is to um, is to identify our mission, our vision, and the strategic plan um, mm -hmm. that we'll take moving forward. And then those long-term goals, is, like I said, is hopefully that we'll have um, a very knowledgeable and well-oiled machine of emergency response plans that consider all individuals. And some of this would involve recommendations to the legislature, I think, Absolutely. because uh, emergency response costs money, right? right? right. And people with disabilities need services that cost money. Right. So at some point it would be involved, I think, uh, asking the legislature to respond to uh, the uh, plans. Right, right. right. And um, one of the goals, at least of the PPE for People with Disabilities Coalition, is that um, ultimately we um, have, instead of a committee, 
an, uh, um, an office, uh, mm -hmm. an office of access and functional needs within IEMA, which is Illinois Emergency Management Agency. A lot of other states that do a really good job at um, emergency man management for people with disabilities have a, an, a, a government office, paid staff mm -hmm. um, that are um, required to you know, be accountable for having outcomes right. that are effective. Do, do we know if IEMA has any disabled employees or that claim to be disabled or? You no, know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. because, um, you know, there's a statement that we sometimes like to throw out nothing about us without right. us. Yeah. And I think if they don't have people with uh, disabilities at the center of their um, operation, then they're going to get left out sometimes. Yeah, and I think that's why this um, this committee is so important. And it was um, our long-term goal. Um, actually, it was our original goal to try to get an office. But Senator Fine said, "Let or Senator Morrison said, let's just get the committee in there first, mm -hmm. baby steps, steps, yeah. yeah, and and prove that you know this is a really invaluable committee and that it should have." Um, paid individuals and individuals that are people with disabilities paid in those um, those government offices to inform IEMA on how and what needs to be done. Now, I, I, I've been peripherally involved with this, as of course. Well, I'd say you've been more than that. Yeah. But um, it seems to me that IEMA sees a need for this. Would you agree with that? Yes. Actually, I'd say IEMA was one of our big supporters in, in helping us with um, drafting the bill. Mm -hmm. They said, We worked with them, um, and Senator Morrison said, you should reach out to IEMA. And so we reached out to them. They helped us with the language of the bill. And I think, you know, that commitment um, is was 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 really invaluable. So mm -hmm. it's it's great that um, IEMA has recognized that they that we have to have this um, this a, this committee that they probably were not doing a good job when it comes to the disability community. I, yeah. I mean, they I they think recognize that's safe it. to say. Yeah, yeah, and and they recognize and it, it. And it's a federal issue too. I know people have worked yes. with FEMA at the national level and right. Things are probably moving very slowly there, but they are moving at least. I think the most important thing is that um, understand that when you are not receiving services, um, and despite potentially your your agency or the um, government office that says that they're doing a good job, but you're not receiving, uh, getting the end result that you'd like to, mm -hmm. speak up, reach out to somebody, yeah. advocate. And advocacy is so, so powerful. Right. Um, and group together and find groups um, so that your voice is heard. Second, in an agency, when an agency is contacted and they're told that they're not doing a good job, agencies need to listen to their consumers and to the, the people that like receive their services. Yeah, we know people with disabilities still face a lot of discrimination and this is one area where lives are at stake. Yeah. So yep. thank you for all your good work and um, thank you for coming today. Thank you so much for having me. Mm. Great. Yeah, um, thank you uh, to our audience today for tuning in. Uh, this has been Adapt Productions and we had uh, uh, Laura Van Pembroke on today and we're so pleased to have uh, presented this uh, program that talks about the needs for emergency services for the disability community. We hope you'll tune in this time and in the future. Thank you. Thanks.